Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us um, at, at Catalyst this evening, regardless of the fact that we are in Shrink. I thank you all for, for um, joining us anyway, in spite of that. Um, so, so earlier this week, uh, I was reading an article from the Babylon Bee. I don't know, a lot of you guys are probably familiar with that. Um, and, and the article was titled, What Your Pastor's Pulpit Says About His Theology. And so I thought that might be kind of funny to, to read. I don't know, Ben's laughing over here, he probably saw this one. But, um, so, so here, I, music stand uh, is described as a sermon preached from a music stand is actually just sharing what's on your heart, and that's just terrible. Uh, these life lessons are just as flimsy as the cheap music stand from which they're preached. And the theology rating is just medium bad. So I guess that's not, that's not terrible, but um, hopefully I, I can hold up to something a little stronger than, than what, I, what I just read. So <laughs> yeah, maybe just, just, just medium. Um, but regardless, you guys, didn't, you guys didn't come here to, to hear my lame attempt at, at humor, and really uh, that was just to get some of the nerves out anyway. So um, we'll go ahead and, and get into our passage for the evening. Um, I'd invite all you guys to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Um, if, if you're still getting familiar with your Bible, it's in the second half in between Romans and 2 Corinthians. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and read that and then open us in a word of prayer. <clears throat> so starting in verse 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care that this liberty of yours has not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, who have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Uh, now, Lord, we thank you for uh, this evening. I thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to gather together as a body of believers to dive into your word and, and to study it. Um, God, I pray that you uh, would speak through me tonight, that, that these would be your words and not mine, um, and that I'd be able to effectively communicate the, the words here and, and what you have for us. Um, God, again, I thank you for everything you've given us, uh, and it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. So, as you guys know, we, we've been studying uh, the book of 1 Corinthians all, all semester. Oh, that might, I guess that's not going to stand, stand up. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, we hit a transition point. Uh, when we look at the first six chapters, so chapters one through six, Paul is addressing issues or, or concerns that he has heard about in, in the Corinthian church. And, and so these are issues um, of his own observation or, or from sources. And so these are things um, like sexual immorality. Um, he's, he's talked about divisions within the church, lawsuits against other believers. Um, but I guess it would have been about three weeks ago when we started chapter 7. That's where we hit this, this turning point. And now from chapter 7 to 11, Paul is addressing issues that um, the Corinthian church has written to him about. Um, and, and the reason that we know this is not because we have this letter of all these questions, but um, this phrase, now concerning. Um, and it's found in, at the start of a bunch of chapters in, in chapter 7 through 11, and chapter 8 is one of those chapters. And so chapter 8 begins in verse 1 uh, with, now concerning things sacrificed to idols, or if you're reading ESV, now concerning food offered to idols. And so by this statement, and really the context of the rest of the chapter, we can conclude that Paul is attempting to answer the question, is it acceptable for Christians to eat meat that was previously sacrificed to an idol? And now I want to note that I can say with a pretty high degree of certainty that um, for the people sitting in this room, you probably have never or will ever um, experience this, this dilemma. Uh, and, and so you may be wondering, well, Chris, why are you preaching on this tonight? And I would say, because Nathaniel told me I had to. <laughs> Uh, now, I, I say this lightheartedly, lightheartedly because, um, you know, the reality is that this is a much deeper issue than, than just food offered to idols. Um, you know, Paul is getting at a, a much deeper point, and it has much more broad appeal than just this issue here. And so what I'd like to do tonight is um, study this chapter within the context of food offered to idols, because I think that's really important for us when we study scripture, is to study in the context of, of what it's saying. 
Um, but I'd also like to highlight Paul's main point and, and how that applies to us as Christians in 2017. So to do this, I'd first like to just briefly overview the, the, the chapter as a whole, um, starting in verse 1. So Paul writes, Now concerning food or, food or, or things offered to idols. And so you may be wondering, why are the, the Christians in Corinth even asking Paul this question? Why is this even coming up? And so as a, a lot of you would know, um, the, the Greeks and Romans, they worshiped pagan gods. Um, and, and there was this thought that evil spirits and demons would attach themselves to food and, as a way to try and, and defile a person. And so one way that you could rid your food of, of these demons or spirits is by offering a portion of it to one of these pagan gods. And so you may think, well, then the Corinthian the Christians in Corinth just shouldn't eat that meat. That w- that'll be perfectly fine. But, but the problem, that, that's much easier said than done. Um, a lot of this meat that may have been offered to idols, the rest of it, the remainder, went to markets, and it was sold. And, and, and so Christians either, they may or may not have known if their meat they were eating was being offered to an idol or not. And so that's kind of what prompted them to ask this question. Is it okay if we eat this meat, this meat offered to idols? And so that's, that's how we start in verse 1. And we jump down to verse 13, kind of the end, the end of the chapter, we, we find Paul's answer. And so Paul writes in verse 13, Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. And so when, when you read this at first glance, you think, like, this is kind of a, an interesting answer to this question. If Paul was giving an answer that was strictly based in knowledge, which we're going to talk about in more depth a little bit later, he would have just said, idols are nothing. Meat offered to nothing is just meat. So eat all the meat that you want. That would be our, our natural tendency. That's, that's what he could have said if he was answering just based on that knowledge. But it, it goes m- much more than that. He, he completely shifts the focus of his answer to another person. When he writes, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. And, and this, is really, this is a really important concept. And really, this is Paul's main point for the entire chapter, which you can actually find it more clearly spelled out in verse 1, where Paul writes, knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. And some of you have love builds up. And so we're going to walk through this text tonight. Um, first to see Paul's answer to the Corinthian church on this specific issue of meat offered to idols. But we're also going to see the development of this idea that knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. And so I, I've broken this passage down into four parts. Thought we're going to study it. Uh, I apologize because I did not get my notes to Nicholas and Mariah to get that in the U version. Um, so I'll, I'll try to restate them every time we get to them. But, but the four sections of the text are, are as follows. So verses 1 through 3, Paul presents the principle of arrogant knowledge. Verses 4 through 6, Paul presents the premise of Christian liberty. Uh, verses 7 through 12, Paul presents the practice of unrestrained action. And in verse 13, Paul presents the pledge of humble deference. And so I'll go ahead and start with our first section, verses 1 through 3, and I'll read those. So starting in verse 1. Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. And so from this first section of the text, we, we can conclude the following statement, the following thought. Knowledge is important, but when not stewarded correctly, can be harmful. And so let me kind of explain where, where this concept comes from. And, and to do that, I, I need to mention the, the overall attitudes of, of the Christians in Corinth. And, and honestly, uh, it's not great. Um, so in general, the, the members of the church in Corinth were going about their business, and, and they really were not concerned with how their actions were affecting other people. And the reason that I say that is if we look at the, the content of, the, of the, the chapters in 1 Corinthians, think about chapter 6, lawsuits against other believers, Think about chapter 12 when uh, the Corinthian church members are arguing about which spiritual gifts are the best and who has which and and things like that. If we look at chapter 13, Paul really has to remind them what it actually means to love another person within the context of the church. Uh, They really weren't concerned with how their actions were affecting other people, and chapter 8 is no exception to that. Um, So so when we we start this out, Paul begins by talking about knowledge. Um, and, And just for your own information, when I study this text, the word know or knowledge occurs 11 times in 13 verses. Um, so it's a very important concept for what we're talking about tonight. And Paul approaches knowledge as, as a good thing. Um, and when we read in, in some of his other letters, like Colossians, for example, Colossians 1, uh, 9, Paul prays that the Colossian believers would receive spiritual wisdom and understanding. And so he's highlighting that knowledge is a gift from the Holy Spirit uh, to help us mature in our faith. But when we look to the very next thought, knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. A a gift that makes us arrogant. It should be our goal that the Holy Spirit makes us arrogant. That doesn't make any sense, 
but that's also not what Paul is saying here. Paul, it, he's trying to bring to light the fact that what we do with our knowledge defines its true nature. The, the way that we act, the way that we steward that knowledge is, is what really defines its true nature. So I would consider uh, our ministers, Nathaniel Shandy, Nicholas, Mariah, Elijah, th- they're all very knowledgeable people. They also did not pay me to say that. Uh, I, I said that of my, my own. Uh, <laughs> I would not, however, consider any of them to be arrogant people. And so what gives? If what Paul is saying, that that should equate there. Um, and the difference comes in the way that they steward, the way that they direct their knowledge. You know, I, I wouldn't consider Nathaniel an arrogant person because of the kind and loving way that he directs that spiritual knowledge that he does have. Um, if you need a second example other than our ministers, think of, think of Jesus. Of all the people who have ever or who will ever live, he had the most right to his knowledge. He had the most knowledge. Of, he had the most knowledge of any person ever. And yet, you wouldn't consider Jesus an arrogant person, would you? You wouldn't. And it's because of the way that he stewarded his knowledge uh, with an attitude of love and humility. And that's exactly the point that Paul is trying to make here in, in, in this verse one. He's reminding the mature Christians in Corinth not to let their knowledge get in the way of uh, building up weaker, younger Christians. And, you know, part of this attitude of love stems from uh, what Paul is reminding them in, in, in verse 2. Uh, when we read here in verse 2, if anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. So with the exception of Jesus, our knowledge is incomplete. And so it, it, it doesn't make much sense for us to not direct our knowledge in a loving way because when it comes down to it, we don't know everything. And so it's foolish for us to look down on others who also don't know, anything, don't know everything. Um, and, and more than, more than knowledge, we've talked a lot about knowledge too, but, but love has a lasting effect, which is evident in what Paul says here. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him in verse 3. Now, this expression is a, a true test of uh, the direction in which our hearts are oriented in regards to our knowledge. So Paul is trying to communicate to the church in, in, in Corinth that the way that they communicate their knowledge matters, um, and, and specifically in regards to the issue of food offered titles. And so... You know, in, in what way can we guard uh, against directing our knowledge arrogantly? So this principle, for example, can be applied uh, when we hold one another accountable for our sin. Uh, is this something that's important? It's absolutely something that's important. Um, the conviction of sin from a fellow believer uh, is one way that we can push each other forward uh, in our faith. But the way that we do it is very, very important. Um, you know, if we call out our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in a loving way without sacrificing truth, that's how we effectively steward the knowledge that we have. And so, so we've talked a lot about this knowledge, but what specific knowledge is Paul talking about in this passage? And this is going to bring us to the second section, verses 4 through 6, which is the premise of Christian liberty. So starting in verse 4, Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. And so from, the, from these verses, from this section of the text, we can, we can conclude the following. That as Christians, we have freedoms that we can enjoy through Christ. And so Paul really refocuses the, the, the letter here at this point in verse 4 when he writes, therefore concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols. And he, he really aims to answer this question in a really strategic way. If we look at the second half of verse 4 and verse 5, he goes about describing the true nature of what an idol really is, which in short is nothing. Um, the doctrine of God is, is one of the foundational doctrines of the Christian faith, and, um, and it's a very very complex uh, issue. There's a lot of different moving pieces to it, um, and so I won't get into anything too, too crazy and deep here, but there is, there's one truth I think that we can all agree on that we all have to agree upon here in this room, and it's that there is one God. So the God who uh, spoke everything into existence is the same one God who spoke uh, to Abraham in Genesis, who is the same God who spoke through the prophets, who is the same God who spoke through Jesus in his ministry, who is the same God who will um, speak the, the kingdom back to, back to Jesus at the end of days. You know, there is, there is one God, and so by that statement, there are no other gods. Uh, if we accept that there is one God, we have to also accept that there are no other gods. And that's really what Paul is trying to communicate to them in, in a few less words, um, but, but that's the same idea here. And so um, Paul is not denying that, that people don't talk about 
these gods, you know, when he uses the phrase here, if there are so-called gods and many lords, you know, he's not denying that people don't talk about this. Um, but, but what he's saying is that they have no true spiritual significance. They are a man-made creation. Um, and, and so what does that mean for them in Corinth then? Paul's suggesting that since these idols are nothing, meat that is offered to nothing is simply meat. Uh, in the mind of the mature believer who acknowledges that there is one God, the meat can be consumed with a clear conscience. You know, and, and this concept is even, even further reinforced in verse 5, with the, or in verse five uh, with the reminder, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. Now Paul goes one step further, too, in his declaration of the deity of God in, in verse 6, saying, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Now, if you, if you think about this, this is really a profound statement. When we look at verse 5 and verse 6 together, they complement each other in the fact that they are affirming the equality of God the Father and God the Son. And, and even more so, you'll notice the difference in, in verse 5, he writes, we exist for him. In verse 6, Paul writes that we exist through him, as in we exist through Jesus Christ. This existence through Jesus Christ refers to our new existence as born-again Christians. We were bought uh, at a price, a price that was dearly paid through the atoning blood of Jesus, and because of that sacrifice, we live on eternally. Now, this new life brings with it a set of Christian liberties uh, that had not previously been enjoyed before his work on the cross. Uh, we are no longer bound to dietary restrictions or a sacrificial system, but now we, we live on in these new found freedoms in Christ. If we, if we look to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, uh, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It is through this fulfillment that we gain these new liberties in Christ. So to the Christians in Corinth, this looked like the liberty to eat meat that was previously offered to idols and, and maintain a clear conscience. For us today, uh, this looks like our liberty to enjoy various forms of entertainment or have a glass of wine to dinner. Um, our Christian liberties allow uh, people like doctors and nurses to work on Sunday mornings when unavoidable and not feel guilty about missing church, for example. And so just like the Corinthian church, our knowledge of the work that Jesus did on the cross uh, allows us to enjoy these Christian liberties. But what about the people who don't have that same knowledge, who don't have that same level of, of understanding? And, and that's where Paul is going to take us next in verses 7 through 12 when, when he presents the practice of unrestrained action. So starting in verse 7. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to the idol until now eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, who have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Now, from this section of the text, we can conclude the following. Failing to yield our Christian liberties for the sake of less mature believers leads to sin. And so to, to kind of to break that down, Paul begins this section by stating, however, not all men have this knowledge. Now, first, what knowledge is he referring to? He's referring to the knowledge that we just finished discussing from verses 4 through 6, um, that there is one true God, that all idols are nothing more than a man-made work of fiction. And, and this idea that uh, not all men have this knowledge is, is a fact that we face today, too. Not every person is in the same place in their spiritual walk. Not every person has the same level of spiritual understanding as other people. And so that really affects the way in which we act uh, around them. And so the, the root of this issue that Paul is addressing here is that newer Christians in Corinth were eating meat previously sacrificed to idols, and their conscience was defiled. Because you see, even though they, they were Christians, uh, their conscience still convicted them that eating meat offered to idols was wrong. They still imagined that these idols were real and evil, and thus the act of eating meat offered to them was sinful. And so Paul first wants to correct this thinking uh, when he says <clears throat> in uh, first, uh, verse 7, uh, but food will not, or verse 8, sorry, but food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. And so this is the concept that food is spiritually neutral. Uh, it doesn't draw us any closer or any further uh, from God. And so before we move any further, I want to just quickly recap some of what we studied so far. So first we discussed the principle of arrogant knowledge, where we concluded that the way in which we direct our knowledge uh, has to be in a loving way with the intent to build up others. 
And so then we discussed the concept of Christian liberties, these liberties that we uh, can uh, experience and, and because of our freedom in Christ. And so what happens then if, if we take these Christian liberties and we don't steward them in a loving way? And this is a scenario that Paul brings to light in verses 9 through 12. And so I'll read those here starting in verse 9. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Now, I hope that you see verse 9 is really just a restatement of this concept that knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. When Paul writes in verse 9, but take care that this liberty, so take care that this knowledge of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak, or make sure that your knowledge edifies other brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, we cannot let our actions lead another person into sin. And in verses 9, or 10 and 11, Paul warns the Corinthians about the dangers of casually exercising their Christian liberties without regard to um, the, the feelings and, and actions of other people. You see, when the mature Christian in Corinth exercised the right to consume meat previously offered to an idol, they were seen by the weaker Christian, and that further encouraged them to also consume that type of food. But as we just mentioned, that their conscience was defiled because they still uh, thought of that as sin. And so the mature Christian is taking something that is perfectly fine and good and effectively made it sinful. Uh, and Paul really drives this home when he writes, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so he's basically saying, guys, these aren't just your friends. These aren't just your neighbors. These aren't just people that you've seen in the street. These are the people whose sins were put on the cross and carried up the hill. These are the people who Jesus laid down his life for. And you're effectively adding to that. Um, and if that wasn't enough, too, Paul, Paul takes it one step further in his, con in his conviction by stating, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. And that really brings the severity of the situation full circle. So because the Christians did not steward their knowledge and their Christian liberty in a way that would edify others, they have now basically taken a freedom in Christ and turned it into a sin against him. And now Jesus was not silent on this issue. If we look to Matthew chapter 18, uh, verse 6, Jesus says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. And I want you to just think about that for a minute. That's a pretty, that's a pretty serious statement to make. But that's exactly the scenario that Paul is writing about here. The mature believer causing the weaker brother to sin. And Jesus is essentially saying it would be better if that person was dead than to lead him into sin. You know, typically, uh, for me, I can identify my actions that lead me to sin. If, if I'm doing something that's sinful, um, I can try to stop either the willpower or the Holy Spirit, maybe a little bit of both. But how often do we think, how are my actions leading someone else into sin? Because that's what Paul is saying here, is that even when it's our action causing someone else to sin, it's still sin for us. And so let me, let me provide two examples of this um, that might make a little bit more sense for us today here. Um, because like I said, I know that this idea of meat offered to idols is not something that we're super familiar with. So um, first, uh, I'll mention the Christian liberty of drinking alcohol. So we know that if you are 21 years of age and you can do so responsibly, that it is perfectly fine for you to have uh, a drink of alcohol. Um, the Bible speaks in many places about the sin of drunkenness, but it, it doesn't anywhere condemn uh, the responsible consumption of alcohol. So... Now let's say, for, for example, if I, if I go out and, and I, I have a drink um, and someone from here, they, they see me doing that and they think, well, he's a good guy, he's doing this, uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do the same thing. And so they go out the next night and, and they go out with their friends, but they don't have the same uh, level of responsibility and they fall into drunkenness and, and thus they fall into sin. That's sin for them, but what Paul's saying, that's also sin for me because I did not steward my Christian liberties in an edifying way that would build up others. Now, it's, now we're both in sin. Um, so a second example, you know, because I'm not, I'm not here to harp on that issue specifically or suggest that that's the only application of our Christian liberty, um, would be in regards to entertainment. Uh, Paul writes in, in, in Romans 14, verse 17, we're kind of switching gears here, uh, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so just as a quick side note, if you guys have the opportunity to study Romans chapter 14, even tonight if you can, I would encourage you to do so. 
Uh, it's a parallel passage to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. So a lot of the themes uh, are identical in some instances, but they're, it's the same content that Paul is writing about in both places. Uh, we just don't have time to go into that tonight. Um, so uh, we're just going to look at this one verse specifically. But uh, what Paul is really saying here is that the kingdom of God is not one of temporal things when he writes. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Um, our salvation is not based in these earthly things, and thus we can enjoy some of those things. And so think now about some of the music that you listen to or the movies that you watch or the video games that you play. Uh, some of that music may have themes or language that some people may not be able to handle, but you can. Uh, some of those movies that you watch may have content that, while it doesn't bother you, it may be a stumbling block for another person. Um, and the same thing can be said about video games. And so while watching a movie with romantic themes may be perfectly okay for you, it may not be for someone else. Uh, I'm not suggesting that all content of any kind can be okay if you just have a good heart about it. That, that's not what I'm saying here. Um, but but the, the truth is that there are some themes that, that some people can handle and watch with pure intentions and other people can't. And when we, don't, when we aren't conscious of that, that can lead other people into sin in the same way that this situation is leading people into sin. And so what are we supposed to do? Uh, this is the question that we started with in verse 1, uh, and we finally arrived at an answer uh, about 30 minutes later. Uh, I'd like to think it's not because I'm just long-winded or like to hear myself talk, but um, because this is a serious question with serious implications. And so Paul now turns to verse 13, this final verse, with uh, his final thoughts on this matter. And he presents the pledge of humble deference. And so we read in verse 13. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. And so from this final verse and really everything leading up to the point in, in this chapter, we can conclude the following. In some instances, it is better for the mature Christian to sacrifice their personal liberties for the sake of other believers. And so, as we said at the, at the beginning of this, this sermon, Paul's conclusion here is not primarily based in knowledge. If it was, it would be based in the knowledge that we talked about in verses 4 through 6 and that... Uh, that the Corinthians should be able to freely exercise their Christian liberty and the fact that there are no other gods, there are no idols, and meat is just meat. Uh, but his answer here is primarily rooted in edifying or building up others in love. You know, Paul concludes that if eating meat is going to cause someone to sin, then he's never going to eat it again. Paul is taking his personal liberty, his Christian liberty, and setting it aside on behalf of other believers. And, and this attitude is based in love, which, which we've learned from this principle in verse 1. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. But where does this loving attitude really come from? Who is the ultimate example of perfect love? And I hope that in your brains you're all saying Jesus, because <laughs> that, that's, that's who I think of when I think of this loving attitude and example. And when I was reflecting on this concept, I could not help but think of Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 11, specifically verses 5 through 8. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, this is the section of Philippians, also written by Paul, um, that depicts the humiliation and the exaltation of, of Jesus in his, in his ministry. And so I want you guys to think about this for a minute. I don't, know if, I don't know if you ever have, but think about all the things that Jesus gave up when he stepped down from heaven uh, onto earth. Think about all the things that he had to give up. Think about him giving up uh, heavenly glory. He gave that up. He gave up right standing before God. He had to take on the wrath of God for our sin. He, he gave up his right standing. Uh, he gave up independent authority. He was no longer allowed to do whatever he pleased, but on, on the plan and path set before him from God. You know, Jesus freely gave up all of those things so that he could take the lowest form of a man and walk this earth. He gave up all of those things for, for us. He gave them up for the very people who would crucify him. And now I, I'm not equating uh, Jesus stepping down from heaven uh, the same way that I shed my Christian liberties. I think that would be wrong and, and not, a, not a very good application, uh, a direct correlation. There's a lot of differences, but the attitude is the same. The reason behind that sacrifice is the same, and it's, it's love. You know, we're called to put aside our liberties and build each other up in love, even when it means giving up something that we have every right to enjoy. And so I recently read an article by uh, Pastor Paul M. Sadler, and it was about, about Christian liberties, and he concluded that Christian liberty is like fire. <clears throat> and so fire, fire is good in a lot of ways. Um, it has a lot of really good uses. It can provide warmth. It can help provide energy. It can make our table settings a little more romantic. <laughs> um, but when not used correctly, fire can be bad in a lot of ways as well. It can burn and destroy. Uh, it can cause death and destruction. You know, we need to view our Christian liberties like we view fire. 
and so that we don't use them in a way that destroys, but a way that edifies and builds up, builds up others through love. And so as the worship team comes back up, um, I'd like to conclude and kind of wrap up this, this passage. Um, you know, Paul's final resolve from verse 13 was that he would never eat meat again if it led someone else into sin. And so I, I have to ask the question to all of you, in what areas of your life are you not yielding your Christian liberties for the sake of fellow believers? You know, what are areas in which we can put aside things that we may have every right to enjoy for the sake of building up others? Um, you know, it, it's my hope that we would become a community focused on that, on building up each other in love, because love has lasting effects. We, we mentioned that in, in this first section. Um, if you take anything away from this sermon, from what I've said tonight, uh, I, I hope that it would, you would remember Paul's words from verse 1, and that knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. And when we make a more uh, conscious effort to build others up, even if it means personal sacrifice, I think that we will start to see a clearer picture of, of who Jesus is and the love these call us to share. And so let's, let's pray. Um, Father, again, I thank you for um, everything that you've given us, the, the mercies that you've shown us. I thank you for the opportunity you've given us tonight to, to dive into your word. Um, and God, I pray that as, as we go out, Lord, we would take this, uh, this concept, the knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies to heart. I pray that... Um, and the things that we do, that we would be conscious of the way that those affect other people. Um, I pray that we would have a, a humble attitude in setting aside the liberties that we have for the sake of others. Um, and, and I pray that in doing so, it would be um, rooted in love and the love that you've shown us, the love that we're called to show back to, to other people. Um, God, again, I thank you for this opportunity that we, that we have every week. I thank you for the people here. I pray that you'd be with them as, as we go out. Um, and again, I just thank you for, for uh, your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.